I would like people to know that the Armenians are survivors. That survivor gene lives I'll call you back. in Bye. those who come after. I was born in Bari, Italy, and we came here, my parents and I came here in February of 1952. So we came straight to Niagara Falls. The Armenian community actually um, brought us here, put us up at, um, they found a home for us. It was on Angela Court, which was right down the street from the club right now. There's like one house left there now. Both my parents were born in Greece. My mother was born in Corfu, and my father was born in Pius. My mother was Jewish, so she was in a concentration camp in Auschwitz. And after the war, when she got liberated, they were sent to Italy. And my dad, after the war, told my grandmother, and his, he, has, he had a brother and a sister, he said, go back to Armenia and I'll meet you in Armenia. Well, they went to Armenia, he went to Italy. I don't know why. He met my mother there, because uh, they were at the camp for a couple years. And they ended up getting married, uh, and I was born there. My name is Sonia Gregian, maiden name Saru Khanyan. Born in Woodstock, Ontario, Canada, went to grade school there. Uh, moved to St. Catharines, Ontario and completed high school there. And a few months after that came to Niagara Falls, New York to marry an Armenian from Niagara Falls, New York. My, um, my father was born in Armenia and he was one of the survivors of the Armenian genocide. He was either four, five, or six years old. Uh, they never could remember when he was born. All they could tell me was that he was born during the blizzard on St. Sarkis Day. Since I was a stay-at-home mom, at that point, uh, they dragged me down there. And I just did what they told me to do. And I was amazed at how they got things done. Not to mention the fact that when they served 200 people dinner, they served them on china plates. And they'd be there washing those dishes without a complaint. I learned a lot from watching them and what a lot of work was. And I have to say, every one of those women had the softest hands I ever knew. I don't think I started going there until I joined the ARS. Probably. Yeah, because yeah. I, I think I joined the ARS in 94. And um, that's when I really got involved because I mean I was raising my children too. You were so still I, working. Too. I was working, um, and I I you know had two kids, so I really wasn't going there. Once I joined the ARS, then I started to go to you know to help them bake and in the kitchen and stuff. I think I dragged you. Probably. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the kitchen was small. It, it was, was half of what, what it, it was. is now. We. Ex expanded the kitchen and you know to we the bar. Out, we took out seven feet of the bar. bar. In the old days all the boys would come and stand at the bar but we didn't have that anymore and the older they got the less they drank. So. But I don't know how those women fed 200, 250 people in a kitchen half that size. But they did. Always chicken and peel off on Sunday. Yeah. It meant you were being successful in the new world. Now, I don't know if my mother did it just on Sundays or, you know, depending on what meat she had, maybe she made it with that too. But yeah, you always had it at least once a week, at least once a week, if not, you know, if there was leftovers, then you had it twice. But Well, it was my mother's recipe. Um, the only thing that I've changed on it was the type of rice. Okay, it's a simple recipe. It's a stick of butter, you melt it, a cup of orzo a pound of rice, and I use Uncle Ben's rice because I like that better, but in the days when my mother made it and the other old ladies and even at the club, they use that Riceland rice. I always put a little extra butter in, but yeah. that I'm guilty of. I always <laughs> that's do. appreciated. But that was my mother's recipe. That's what she made, and that's what I learned, you know, watching her in the kitchen make it. Even rice pilaf, I mean, if you look at recipes for rice pilaf, they make it with like almonds, they make it with raisins, Currants. they make it with so, like there's a, a wedding pilaf that they call, you know, there's different pilafs. I mean, I like the basic one, that's the only one I make, but I mean, you, there's other ones that you can make. And then as she said, there's the bulgur pilaf. Yeah, too, when we have make. our picnic, she makes the rice pilaf, I make the bulgur pilaf. 
Well, for the picnic, we go through, uh, let's see, 24 pounds of rice. And the you same. Know, but we don't make it, you know, we make like, well, how many? Six, we do six to eight pounds in each container. In each I mean, because you gotta, time. you know, because then it won't fit. But, yeah, yeah. We, we go down. The most we've made in a container is eight, eight pounds. Right. We go down that Sunday morning and uh, we start. She's on one side of the stove, I'm on the other. You know, just to keep it alive as long as we can, we're hoping that we can get a few younger people to come in and, and learn and, and join us because we're not going to be around forever, you know, and it's it's a beautiful um, community. It's a beautiful uh, type of thing that, you know, our food, our culture, everything. So we just want to perpetuate it and, you know, keep it going if we can. But it's enjoyable. It's a, it's a feeling, yeah. it's a sense of accomplishment. And knowing that you're providing what people want and keeping a tradition alive. It, it, I think it's very important to keep tradition. Traditions are built through uh, language, music, food, dancing. And as much of that as we can keep going, I, I think we owe it to the generations that are coming to keep those traditions alive. And if, if they remember that, then some of them will delve into the past and learn even more.